the god of war. Wait, really? For actual years, people have been telling me to quit screaming about Lords of Shadow and Darksiders. Lord knows that one's outdated. And finally play God of War. Okay, bet. Bursting straight out of the creative womb of Studio Santa Monica, a first-party Sony Interactive Entertainment subsidiary, the series engraved itself entry by entry, slash by bloody slash, into the Western canon of video game masterpieces. Everyone knows God of War. But hark, it's K-Bash with the dunce cap, 20 years behind the times, as usual. God of War is a game about a hulking man dudeman sporting a nice shade of plot purposes pale, who journeys through Greece painting literally everything red and screaming at literally everyone. No! He's one of those characters who, regardless of what you think of the games, is undeniably funny. I give the action-adventure genre that midway point between DMC and Zelda, I guess, a little too much crap. I'm self-aware, okay? I know that not everyone is built to mash out combos for four to six hours, and hey, I don't want to play most raw puzzle games either. If anything, action-adventures sit in a nice sweet spot, always shifting gears to keep the player's attention. <laughs> Pay attention, ADHD kid! And spoiler alert, that's God of War in a nutshell. It's not the first or only series to offer a gameplay smorgasbord, but damn it, God of War packaged it right. If you're wondering where all the other games are, I'll cover them another day and keep things neat. The original trilogy traces an interesting design lineage and a linear story regardless of prequel titles and the eventual new direction the series is currently charting. But enough about that, I wanna press the buttons! I'm gonna press the buttons! Ah, Kratos. That's a face only a mother could love. Okay, I just got back from the Google searches and, uh, never mind. The player's introduction to God of War, their first look at Kratos, is him, uh, cliff diving? It sets the tone pretty well and tells you quite a bit about dev priorities. Not everything's fun in games all the time. Play can be serious and cinematic and artistic, and that's not unbroken ground, even at this time. But shoot, man, cutting from the title screen to the intro like that? It's cinematic! <laughs> Either way, we know what we need. Kratos is a man with a chip on his shoulder, and we're put to work hacking droves of dudes into chunks. It's a hot start and slightly more difficult than you'd expect. Aside from having to learn the fundamentals of combat, including combos and guarding, you're also taught about puzzles, and that they can relate directly to- Ugh. Would you stop? You learn that combat and puzzles are both relevant and potentially integrated. So, differing gameplay elements are integrating with each other. And just for good measure, let's throw a uh, gameplay and narrative also work with each other in harmony. How you ask? Quick time events, these button pop-ups that greenlight murder animations, more or less cap off every major enemy in the game, and several smaller ones too. The game wants to convey that Kratos is a brutally violent person, so hey, press X to gouge an eye, mash X to struggle to the death. It wraps the player up in the violence, uses mechanics to carry a feeling, channel a vibe. It's impressive. Many titles used quick time events before God of War, but other games generally use them to advance cutscenes. This game uses them to advance execution animations, and failure doesn't often mean death. And Kratos' violence acts as pretty helpful foreshadowing for the end of the intro. First off, Hey kids, you like Vor? Kratos' first real interaction with a person is him killing the poor guy for treasure. I just sat there like, oh, not my new fave being problematic. <laughs> I mean, the game's working title was Dark Odyssey. You know, Odyssey like Odysseus. This isn't some weird and whimsical Greek myth. This is grim, dark man dude myth, okay? Kratos is suffering. That's why he's sleeping with these random supermodels, okay? Kratos is tortured. Don't you get that? And I'll get to the proper review in a sec, but it's important to lay the groundwork on story. Once we cut from Kratos' jump, the whole game is a linear climb to that breaking point. We're not meeting Kratos, the Spartan commander, but Kratos, servant of Ares, delivered from the jaws of death and made arbiter of his will. That's why we got the wacky chain blades. They're a physical reminder of Kratos' oath to Ares and also capable of demigod tier murder stunts. So 20 year spoilers here. The plot slowly reveals itself over the course of the game, but the three major points are these. Kratos is hunting Ares throughout the game, Athena says Kratos will be forgiven if he can kill Ares, and Kratos was tricked by Ares years ago into killing his own family, an act that ended with their ashes bound to his flesh. 
That's why he slept with those women, okay? So he could rub off little bits of his wife's memory on their voluptuous chesticles. God of War is a series of simple yet weighty events. And what they've done with symbolism from the chain blades to the ashes really sells the narrative without needing a metric ton of it. It's palpable, it's playable. I get it. The story isn't ever at odds with the play, and that's the greatest triumph. Your character's practically carrying the events on their person at all times. He's a damaged guy, and he works through it by clobbering minotaurs, you know? Show some empathy. Admittedly, I'm on the HD remaster, but the cinematic sensibilities, man. It's a clean-looking game, and it's something you see more often in Western releases. These huge open screens with minimal HUD clutter or no HUD at all. Until combat happens, it grounds the player in the world, situates them in in a moving painting, and all of them are like this. The actual levels are impressive as well. Moment to moment, you're usually doing something interesting and, at worst, varied. It's not often that the gameplay loop whips into a downward spiral. The energy is always pumping, and while that has a lot to do with the well-placed and frenetic combat, the total number of things the player does, the number of assets on display, outstrips a game like Devil May Cry many times over. DMC gets brought up a lot as a point of comparison, presumably because it was an inspiration for the devs, and though God of War doesn't really do what DMC did, I don't think it's a problem. I don't put God of War next to DMC and Bayonetta and Ninja Gaiden in the hardcore action lineage. Those games, by and large, are selling deeply varied, complex, and difficult combat systems set in a world of some kind. God of War is selling a world first and combat second. And partially, I think that's why God of War ended up as popular as it is. It doesn't gatekeep players even half as thoroughly as those other series. Like, even if you suck, you can enjoy God of War. It's pulling from all kinds of skill pools, okay? Think brainism, handy reandies, analysitis. God of War invites people from many streams, puzzle players and combat optimizers and people who won't read a book, but like stories and video games. I'm a mechanics guy, so I sussed out the ideal combo of moves to speed along the ground. That's just who I am, and they let me. Thank you. As an anti-puzzle guy, I made do. They're really not so bad. In fact, the frequent diversions in God of War feel meaningful and intelligent in a way I didn't feel other God of War clones managed to emulate. It may be the incredible cinematic shots, or the simplicity of the diversions, or frequent gameplay variants and trickling upgrades, or even just the minimal game length. Thing feels good from start to finish, mostly. Of course, when I think of annoying diversions, I think of Darksiders 1, pulling out the Star Fox segment, and then overlong gun runs. God of War doesn't often change up the basics, so the moment-to-moment -moment play feels intentionally designed rather than stuck in to buffer a transition or something. Of course, it also feels immensely produced in a way that other games often don't. Playing it for the first time reminded me a lot of trying out Chrono Trigger and immediately, first level, immediately going, oh, I get it. So I'll just assume the budget was comparatively planetary and keep my dunks to myself. Now, God of War is squarely set in the aesthetic traditions of the West. It's far less willing to be whimsical or wacky. It's played straight. It's grim and moody. It presents a fiction instead of a fantasy. There will be no finding answers and setting the world right. Okay, regardless of any deity influence, this is going to be a fundamentally human story about pain, loss, and repetition. That said, Kratos always stuck out to me. A few months ago, I started thinking about games differently, specifically because of Twooey. That game's caked up with some kind of aesthetic. It's loud, but I don't think any of it detracts from my opinion. I think its whole strange self works together to make it one of the greatest game stories ever. Incidentally, my whole strange self works together to make me a middling YouTube shit wit. So I got to thinking that games should be proud of the medium they come from instead of relying on the traditions of film, for example. I genuinely don't think they'd make a movie with a character like Kratos. This pasty Sasquatch with his bizarre weapons and stark red paint. He stands the f*** out. I love what he represents visually, that his appearance tells a story, but also the acknowledgement that Kratos is in a game and should look like he comes from a game, and fight like he comes from a game with these impossible weapons. And no matter where you are on the screen, you're not losing sight of him. It's amazing. So, 10 out of 10, moment of gaming brilliance. And you never really get tired of watching the guy go. Combat
combat is flowing, weighty, and sometimes tough, but never unclear. You pound out combos by mixing light and heavy attacks. It's similar to something like Dynasty Warriors in terms of actual inputs. You can suck and mash your way through the game, provided you learn the number one defense technique, parrying. Basically, a perfect guard will slow time and give you additional frames to retaliate. Easy, and that window is fairly generous. It keeps fights moving. They teach it quick, like level two quick. Right as you're stepping into Athens Harbor, these enemies hammer the player with long-range slam attacks and it's parry or eat gravel. And because there's a little glow and a wild animation, it's pretty accessible to learn as well. Even though there's no big success spark or any real visual indicator other than slow time, you get the intuitive sense that you can parry almost anything and it turns out to be true. A few different enemy types demand different approaches. You can batter shields with certain attacks or make use of aerial swings to kill flyers. And the only real shakeups to this setup are the magic abilities and the pseudo devil trigger. So the latter. After beating enough ass, you can eventually pop a power up move that trivializes combat, just like Darksiders and other clones, but critically, this one fades very quickly and can't overturn most meaningful battles. So it ends up being an oh sh button, and I respect that. Additional smoothing options that err on the side of the player. Combat Lube! There's also four magic moves. Lightning Javelins for a good ranged option, Medusa's Head for easy, heavy enemy crowd control and shattering, a big AoE zapper, and a fire attack you don't get till very late. God of War has a level up system. You're made to plug points into your two weapons, into your magic, etc., but it rewards maxing specific ones first. So I figure most players opt to max the Blades of Chaos and one or two spells. The other main weapon is cool, but not necessarily better, especially by the time you get it. I think that's where the easiest gameplay criticism is. This is a prototype entry in a now long-standing series, and the combat is fairly unga. The level ups are fairly unexciting. You're definitely Kratos, but hardly your own Kratos. While God of War technically has bosses, they don't even approach what the later games did or action games do in general. The Hydra is a visual spectacle. <laughs> Pandora's Guardian makes use of the environment to win because you're a Greek hero, I get it, and that leaves Ares. Where is that guy anyway? I don't want to be that guy, but uh, couldn't you have done that? like way back in Athens. I spoiled most of Kratos' journey early. The game doesn't go out of its way to tell a winding dramatic tale, instead choosing to unveil the bulk of past shock value over several levels and through various encounters with deities and corpses and all kinds of fun stuff. It culminates with Kratos finding Pandora's box and using its power to grow like 300 feet and fight Ares in one final titan-sized slugfest. It's hard to make any kind of good faith criticism, you know. I actually think this first title is qualities that weren't effectively replicated later on. It has value in its fairly bare-bones combat, just like DMC1. It establishes a world with a focused punch. Naturally, there is no happily ever after. Turns out Kratos' memories are permanent and Athena can't wipe him clean. No wiping that mind die, bro. So he's sequestered away in his little throne room with a stuffed Ares. Ew, so he can brood for an eternity as the new god of war. I like the God of War method of continuity, starting up at the end of the previous game. Any player says, I don't care about story. Kratos says, read. <laughs> so I'm not a fandom guy. I played these games, but I don't really know what other people think of them, except for vague review scores. God of War 2 is really weird. I look back at the first and think, okay, that was good. Hardly any annoying stuff, except for end game balance beams. I can walk a few beams. <laughs> then the sequel comes out and I think, man, it's like they pumped one bar at the cost of another. It's hard to call it better. Let's try to identify what changed. Two picks up after the original, Kratos peering into his scrying pool, apparently shunned by the other gods of Olympus. He sided with the Spartans who sack cities, and as they destroy Athens, Kratos descends with a familiar leap and joins the fray. This scene sometimes gets flack, but I believe it. Regardless of any lesson Kratos learned at the end of one, he was still tricked by Athena effectively and denied a cure for his pain. And he's stewing in a Olympus for eternity now. No sh he's miserable. Kratos is sapped of his godly powers over the course of the tutorial level, which, to be fair, guns harder than the original. This one's quick to teach you and move on. Even starts you with basically the same setup as one, so you can jump in with absolute ease coming off the first. <laughs> Thank you. 
This stuff is what God of War excels at. These dramatic and cinematic segments of play set amidst some looming threat or imminent danger, regardless of any assumed adjacency. To the DMC hardcore action lineage, God of War managed to sell the big screen experience at home. Now I'm the only person I can blame for the mountains of floor corn. It's pure spectacle. The sheer number of assets created and discarded, lost in the shuffle, it's impossible to actually capture the true God of War experience in my format. You just can't taste the flow of the action without playing the thing. Ultimately, you regress to mortal status. Zeus 1v1s you now that it's safe. Zeus, you're like a pro smasher playing his main against his hometown friends. Grow up. And you're nearly killed, only to be given new purpose through Gaia, the ancient mother of the Titans. Oh, we're hunting gods now. Okay. Sequels are fun because you can see what either the devs thought should be changed, what publishers wanted changed, how old design elements interface with new ones, etc. It's a cool look into the minds behind the creative process. For example, someone decided the ground speed moving combo was bad and removed it. Whoever did that, you. Not a lot fundamentally changes between these two first entries. You're still doing the same stuff, level over level, okay, bashing dudes' heads in, like, all the time, completing little puzzles and little scenarios, and having a minor think sometimes, and powering up your arsenal to deal godly damage to various mythological creatures and men. Yes, the levels are still gorgeous and must have either burned PS2s alive or the devs were wizards with a lot of coin. Either way, it's stunning. Stages are just as varied as before, though some of the challenges get a a little weird and hard to understand or just verge on frustrating. I definitely stopped more often in this one than the first and never because of combat difficulty. It was always because of a needlessly stiff puzzle segment or confusing presentation, but that's the nature of the beast. I am gonna funny scream. The action adventure doesn't care how much you love to schmoove. Pull out the old microwave and get cooking. Or in this case, mashing. By the way, carpal tunnel people, you haven't fun yet? Combat is weird on second pass, like in one things are simple and clean. Just combo out and parry, occasionally roll. I found a lot of sections more strict. I had to parry more often, had to pay attention more often. Kratos loses some of his combo strings and options from the previous entry. I figure it's because he was just efficient as hell. Dude could do anything convincingly, and it made the combat easier in places than you'd expect. Two just doesn't hit the same, and it's minor, not really a big deal, and certainly more pronounced after just exiting the first. So what issues did the devs address? I think the weakest element of the first game is a relative lack of bosses. Yeah, you've got a Hydra and a giant undead Minotaur, okay cool, but no Chimera, Manticore, no Scylla, etc, etc, and down the list ad nauseum. For a game keying into spectacle as a pillar of design, it's unfortunate that what appears to be the bulk of the budget is tied up in assets with few quality capstone enemies. God of War 2 changes that up, but in a way that fits the scenario. So no, you don't kill all these incredible monsters, though you do pummel a few, no doubt. Instead, God of War 2 pulls figures from Greek myth into the struggle against Olympus. You're made to fight Theseus, a walking piece of history who regards Kratos as some upstart punk, until you shove his head in the door and kick that bass pedal. Holy shit! Okay, that's how we're playing this. All right. You battle with Perseus, who slew the Gorgon and just brutalize him. I appreciate the level of disrespect that Kratos brings to Greek myth. I'm starting to feel bad for these people. Oh no, that guy's got wings. That's Icarus, bro. Kratos, please. Not Icarus, bro. Come on! Ah! You even fight the barbarian that nearly killed Kratos and kicked off the events of the game. See, they pulled from myth, from the inner fiction, and even threw a couple lesser deities in, the Sisters of Fate and Clotho. <laughs> The game never plays at a hardcore action. You're not made to juggle and combo these guys to death. You just need to get the fight finished, and it'll call for different kinds of skill from raw combat prowess, mastery over options, to puzzle solving mid-fight. Again, the God of War games are designed with such intention, such an eye for detail, that even at their most frustrating, it's hard to really get fed up. That said, changes were made. The levels and puzzles are good, but the focus is on presentation and flair. Many segments are outwardly annoying, or make use of instant death quick time events, forcing restarts, we get elongated transition sequences that never really cropped up in the first, presumably to mask loading or something, but they just aren't super enjoyable. Lots of segments present an immediate threat, which is cool and dramatic, but you'll outright die if you don't queue in instantly. And it happens more than three times, so I'm less inclined to be charitable. Okay, that's enough! No more fun! 
This is all to say that God of War 2 follows the first, and it feels very much like they had to keep designing new challenges, like uh, some kind of modern day Sisyphus, and ended up overturning some of the experience. Medusas could petrify you before, but it was slow. And if you're not mashing roll in this game, you're done in a blink. So yeah, tighten to the breaking point sometimes. Combat does have one major mix up though. The first iteration of Kratos feels a lot like DMC1 Dante in terms of options, and even more limited than that. So they added four weapons total and switched up the spells. Magic still includes a ranged option, an AoE attack, and petrify, but your lightning attack becomes a series of placeable balls that can interact with each other. It's a good, quick move that helps improve the combat by granting light invincibility windows while keeping action flowing. You can actively avoid dodging and guarding by making clever use of magic. Weapons, unfortunately, don't reach the same lofty heights of other games. Let's see, we got Idiot Hammer, we got Late Game Sword, okay, and we've got World of Warcraft, the Burning Crusade Spear. Huh. You're stuck on one until you swap, and you're not allowed to instantly cancel out into a new one mid-combo without some trickery. And that's fine, no reason to ape DMC's bit, but it means that, once again, you've got the chain blades, which you're already invested in, and then you've got everything else. And so I didn't really bother with the hammer, and only messed around with the spear after getting stuck in a single particular segment. Even though they're approaching something resembling cool, the blades are iconic and hard to dethrone. Nice that there's extra options for repeat players, though. I respect the system, even if it's more for fun than necessary. Oh, and Devil Trigger is back and slightly more usable than the first. Whatever, it does what it does. I don't know if I should be saying whatever about your game's power-up mode. The story is a continuation of the first game's events with thematic similarities. Kratos isn't working through his personal guilt as prominently anymore. Now he's fighting with Gaia to destroy Zeus and mostly for revenge. The character shines here better than expected. In the first, he was cruel and misanthropic, and that's only been amplified by an unresolved pain and what he looks at as a betrayal from Olympus. In reality, Kratos is equally culpable in any on-screen villainy. Like, Zeus might be a bad dude for more than a few reasons, but Kratos as a god was still abusing his powers beyond their intended scope, directly harming humans. He's a guy who had a purpose, had power, then lost it along with his autonomy, fought to get it back, ascended to godhood, then lost it all again. This is a power monger in search of a reason to live and not nearly enough intelligence or empathy. It's compelling as drama because Kratos necessarily cannot understand nor resolve the conflict he faces without violence. I get it. We're playing a Greek tragedy here. Nice. And remember when the game turned into Dragon Ball? The chase ends in a battle between a freshly superpowered Kratos and Zeus. Oh my god, I see it now. This is where Lords of Shadow pulled the overly fast quick time event into instant death, into loading screen, into repeat the scene. Wow. So two was fun. Enough. Outlier segments notwithstanding. It brought God of War into a more godly realm. It pumped the spectacle to the moon. It expanded player expression options and streamlined combat to maintain the integrity of the experience. Can I cut the balls any harder? So it turns out I missed the scene where Kratos has naked time with the bath women. I think what God of War needed most was a pissing baby statue whose stream flails wildly while you press X to calm. On this episode of Queer Eye, the boys give Kratos a makeover. Right away, we're doing the face-face thing again, so that's neat. Kratos and the Titans storm Olympus for a final confrontation with their oppressors. But Gaia didn't check her maths, and every Titan is systemically shunted off of Olympus by Zeus and co, while Kratos and Gaia do a tutorial segment. For what it's worth, it's visually stunning, incredible stuff. I'm on the remastered version here again, and yeah, I'm not kidding about fidelity eating performance. The original ran somewhere between 30 and 50 at any given time. These games melt plastic. Put a PS3 on your lap, run God of War 3 and go infertile. See, this is what I'm talking about with God of War and other action games. They're selling an experience, a slow roll story about climbing a mountain that took three games. You either enjoy climbing mountains or you checked out to do something mechanically interesting in another game. I didn't grow up with any PlayStation consoles, so my first exposure to the series was through cutscene videos of this game uploaded to YouTube. I watched them because, again, I appreciate the level of disrespect Kratos brings to Greek myth. It's enthralling, this horrible sweaty dude murdering everything Disney said was cool and sweet. Like take Hercules. I will face the world! 
Let's see, Hera's an alcoholic. We are cutting off the sun god's head for a lantern. You know what? Kratos gouges out Poseidon's eyes and snaps his scrawny neck in the first 10 minutes, drowning the countryside and ruining Greece. So, so consider them stakes raised. Everything else though, I don't know about God of War 3, guys. I just don't know. Something happened between 2 and 3, like the PSP game, for example. I'm not gonna complain about the environments or the puzzles too much, at least. 3 is basically the apocalypse, so everything is drab and moody, and there's a sort of pseudo-horror atmosphere dripping from the walls. And it's thematically appropriate. We went to Olympus, we basically saw heaven, and this is it. Hercules' head reduced to jam. Hera stumbling over her drunken self in a storm-beset garden. Nothing is pleasant about this world. It's like finding out that your wildest dreams about hope and betterness and divinity were, in fact, dreams. The grit of the withering fiction flecks off and stings your eyes. Most environments are like this too. Few actual reprieves exist, and it's the kind of game I'm likely to avoid in the future, not because it's too much for me, it just isn't fun to look at. Since the game takes place in the realm of the gods and flits between Hades, Domain, and others, it feels like it could have been more whimsical, you know? Magical detours could take place. And hey, this game has no problem with breaking tone. It'll straight up throw a PlayStation button rhythm game puzzle at the player. Okay, Aphrodite exists, and we'll get there in a minute. Zeus is fought in a frame that transforms this monumentally important battle into a cheesy Street Fighter match. God of War knows it's a game, wants to be a game, but also plays directly into the cinematic, and there's a weird tension in this entry because of it. Even at their most campy, the other games didn't do stuff like this, but then they were color-drenched and the stakes weren't so high. It was always Mamma Mia versus the world, but now they're running out of time track as kicked in. And nothing about the basic structure of level traversal has changed. You still climb and jump and puzzle things out, platform along. Yes, you gotta light the way through the occasional dark section or run up the walls like Sonic! But it's the same game. The formula was always good. I think it's harder to get lost in God of War compared to Darksiders and Lords of Shadow, depending on the individual entry anyway. But notably, those games were trying to expand on what God of War mastered. And to the game's credit, most transition scenes were cut out, making the experience a pretty clean run from start to finish. The only thing I'm confused about is the combat. Let's be real, God of War 1 was simple, but the system works. 2's fine, shaves a little bit off the top, but you can still mix and match buttons. I don't get what they were going for with 3. Like I do, but... It's a four weapon system again, but all your weapons are functional variants of the chain blades. Look, I appreciate the recognition that the base model, the chain blade, the blades of chaos are iconic. I really do. And you know, the uh, Nemean Kestis is also kind of schmoovin', even if it has to do the uh, extendo chain chomp thing to hang in Kratos' moveset. But seriously, two of these are just light variants on the blades of chaos. And yeah, they each play in a unique way with the purple ones dragging the player along the ground, making little like Explody attacks, and the backbreaker! And the turquoise one also doing unique, important things with attack strings, and they're all very good and special in their own unique way. But why'd they kill the combo system? So, acknowledge, the game's combat is pretty inarguably better. There are people on YouTube who do insane things with this system. But, to be fair, that's not the average play experience. In fact, it's really technically demanding and isn't necessary in any way to complete the game on normal or even above. But you can't start combos off of heavy attacks anymore, at least right away. And many strings have been cut, leading to what I can only describe as a really depressing baseline experience without some kind of external to the game tech skill. You literally can't mash Y into Y anymore. It's just one single heavy attack. It sucks. It feels awful. And it's especially weird coming off two games of a functioning system and being handed the streamlined model on the third go. Admittedly, you're meant to combo with one and swap to other weapons by using their special attacks, and then it makes sense why all the weapons are variation chain blades, because the visuals of swapping won't break immersion this way. You're always Kratos doing Kratos things. Not, you know, swapping a spear for a hammer in a blink. I guess. Bottom line, they tried something new and different, it was good for a specific kind of player, and honestly I would have had more fun with it if I were a little more interested in what they were selling. And it does incentivize meaningful and interesting magic bar usage, you know, not just hoarding it until you need it. It just feels bizarre to pick up after running the others. Like, 
all my old reliables got thrown in the trash. And like before, there's no real gameplay incentive to weapon swap except to dump magic power and maybe greenlight some esoteric strings. You can safely mash away with a single weapon and get plenty of combo points to spend upgrading your weapons. It feels like there should be a damage multiplier for swapping mid-combo if they're going to curtail individual weapon utility just to have multiple weapons at all. Like, obviously, none of this really matters. It'd be worse just doing the same thing a third time with no shakeup, no innovation. I just want to be incentivized to engage with the systems and don't feel that way after playing. That's all. So if the game's shaking up combat and selling spectacle and wrapping up Kratos' arc, you know the bosses are going to be fire. Huh, I didn't realize some of these were even bosses. Okay, three takes up the mantle of badass boss killing simulator, something the second started but didn't push half as hard. And how could it? You were killing demigods and legends, but not the straight up gods of Olympus. I mean, minus Athena, but Poseidon, Hades, Helios, Hermes, Kronos the Titan himself, and Zeus. And some other ones that don't matter, you fight a plethora of relevant, interesting battles throughout the game, and I gotta tell you, this is where it becomes obvious that God of War has never actually tried to swipe DMC's legacy. The battles all sit on a sliding spectrum, anywhere from cool to terrible. Poseidon's a wash, a total trip. You just bash his stupid horse and quick time event him to death. It's fun to watch, even a little fun to participate in. Press both sticks to gouge his eyes, but hardly a test of player skill. Hades is one of the better fights, demanding actual combat ability and pulling a God of War mid-battle shakeup to complete the fight. It's sufficiently epic for the scenario. I think Hermes is one of the worst fights. He runs around and socks you like a pillow full of potatoes, and the chase leading to him is beautiful to play through, but seriously, the fight is basically chasing a light speed sandbag that hits back. Kronos is one of the most infamous battles and highlights everything you need to know about what the devs care about. Kronos is disgusting. You smash and rip off his fingernail. You like this? Do you enjoy looking at this? All the while, you're fighting hordes of meaningless enemies that are ultimately swatted away by the Titan oh, fuck. and platform along his body until you can land a few QTEs. Is it bad? No, it's an experience trademark. It's literally what God of War was made to do. Keep the player saying, holy shit, and that's awesome. It's just not as engaging as certain other games, but it sells Kratos' struggle, both the Herculean scope and the frustration. Like I said, none of these are really about mechanical skills beyond the dodge and guard button. You have to attack, but you don't have to be super deliberate and precise. They'd much rather sell you on a mood or a vibe than a skill challenge. We'll talk Zeus in the conclusion, but let's look at the story. God of War has, for three games now, featured a character bent on vengeance, shown him running all over Greece being being cruel and demanding to everyone he meets, and even when shown kindness or grace, does not appear to be getting better. If it were a longer game and Kratos did anything more than say exactly what he means, it'd be a little more grating, the way I found death and war in Darksiders, but I believe Kratos' struggle as a player because I'm roped into the experience on a mechanical level, the game's selling anger and frustration on all fronts, and because I know Kratos isn't smart or empathetic enough to actually resolve the issues. Unlike those other characters I listed who absolutely have enough intellect to act like humans instead of weird giant man children. This is a regular human elevated far beyond his lot. If you've ever watched someone get famous really quick and implode, this ain't all that different. It's rare for Kratos to do something out of character. He's driven to meet his goals, screams at people to give him what he wants, then takes it by putting the player in the driver's seat. We're made complicit in his villainy and rewarded with unreal boss takedowns, cinematics, and horror gore. It's hard to look away from. Kratos is a train wreck waiting to happen to anyone on screen. Oh, and the coitus. So talking about issues like this sucks on YouTube, especially with games because weirdos get super angry if anyone points out the wallpaper clashes with the carpet. I guess it's personal, but whatever. Noah Gervais referred to it as a sort of running joke, like it was so bad it's self-aware, and I think that's true. It knows it's stupid and gross and expressly man-dude grunka unka uh. to get thrown from the colossus of Rhodes and take a sec to pound it out after. These scenes only crop up once per game on that note. It's kind of like including that weird uncle at the family gathering who makes everyone uncomfortable, but he's family. While they're stupid, I can't stop thinking that Kratos' family's ashes are fused with his skin. And yes, in a story about a tortured man who's seemingly incapable of improving himself and moving on, this kind of rank juvenilia illustrates Kratos' tragedy pretty well. These are flings. They won't even approach numbing the pain. It's 
it's tacky and even uncanny, these supermodels hanging around in war zones. There's some intention to the art. The fear is that this slips too easily into something truly vile. Take Poseidon's princess, who fears Kratos, runs from Kratos, and we're made to chain her up to this device to keep a door open, and when it gives, she's ground into paste. It's so bizarre and horrifying, it almost felt out of character. There I was, playing God of War, the so serious, it's goofy, Greek myth game, and we're terrorizing fairly realistically acting NPCs who are trembling at the sight of the vengeful God of War. It's hard to even call Kratos an anti-hero. As far as I can tell, he's pure evil. I had a moment of revelation, like, oh yeah, Kratos was never good. Only in moments, and only for his own. Huh. So if the intent was to make me think, wow, Kratos is a miserable scum, Woo! art accomplished? Now, 3 tries to counterbalance that with Pandora, I think. Give him a little human element and trace the remnants of his personhood. But the problem is, even with all the worrying and protective behavior, she's ultimately an actual object and not a person. Literally the key to Pandora's box. <laughs> and is used that way even if she's the one who ultimately makes herself a plot device. What I'm getting at is that even if God of War is fine and has artistry guiding it, it's hard to call the game anything but cruel towards women. Yeah, all the other dudes get brutalized too, but women get the unique honor of being made objects of Kratos' desire, terrorized and murdered, degraded, offered no dignity. If they're virile, they're useful. If they're a shrew, they die. Most famous art has gross bits. All art has a target audience. Greek myth isn't kind to women either, but that stuff was penned millennia ago. If we can think and perform this kind of apologism, we can give fair time to critique. God of War doesn't have the worst track record, but 3 is notably creepier, and especially with Poseidon's Bride. If you didn't feel the ick factor as a player, I mean... The real question is, what end does this serve? We're painting Kratos a very sharp shade of evil, so how does the trilogy conclude? We get this multi-phase, drag-out, knock-down battle with Zeus, and when you think you've won, you're actually thrust into a self-reflection segment where Kratos faces his inner darkness. I'm not about to question the celestial mechanics at play here, and as a game, it ends how it probably should, putting you in first person and making you slap Zeus down for good. It makes the player Kratos, and does it convincingly. Athena says, locked somewhere deep inside of you is the light of hope. And that's one hell of an airy message to go out on after piling a legendary carrion feast behind him. And to cut a lot of shit short, Kratos stabs himself with the blade of Olympus to effectively deny Athena's machinations and hand over the power of autonomy, hope, to mortals and free them from the yoke of the gods. He effectively ends the age of the gods in Greece, at least. It makes sense for Kratos, one who despises the gods and his own deification, one who lost everything to them and recognizes, at least, that power is a problem. I just don't believe Kratos. This development seemingly happens after Pandora sacrifices herself and Athena attempts to manipulate Kratos. It feels like his unga ass made a lucky guess about her plan because of his adult oppositional defiance disorder. Or that that entire journey through fear or whatever, trademark hyper accelerated his growth out of nowhere. But whatever, game stories don't always pan out perfect. It ends how it should, even if I wish we felt more of Kratos' development, he's still actively terrible throughout most of the game. So that's it. <laughs> that's the God of War trilogy, an angry, shrieking piece of genuine technical artisanship and quality storytelling that's arguably kneecapped in a few places, none of them hard deal breakers. I might cringe at some of the content I just talked about, but that's not reflective of the gameplay or the series as a whole. It doesn't totally mire the experience and has little to do with where God of War is headed to today. That said, while I loved this spectacle and probably used the word 20 times, I don't really feel Kratos as a character, the same way I don't really care about Oedipus or whoever from Greek tragedy. Like yeah, this guy sure does suck and these scenes sure are interesting, but I'm not weeping out here like it's near Automata. Well, I'd love to look at the other games, but let's be real, let's get 60k max and die off in a month. Hey, it's Kbash. Huge thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, check them out. Beautiful. And double special thanks goes to my extra generous patrons who are Adam Welch, Acropolis, Alex, Alpha 42, Arch, Azura, Axin Azuas, Bear Skeleton, Basement Dweller, Bear Keeper, BZ Soul, Ben M, Bing Bing Doo Doo Oingo Boingo Time, Blake Against the Machine, Boa, Boom Dance, Brios, Brianna Wu, British 
Goose. Cow. Can I cuss on Captain here? Captain Blast. Captain Way. C Dub. Caesar T. Chiefy Boy. Cordon. Chris Bromo. Cody Golden. Couch Mo. Corgi the Lad. Crater. Chrono 19D. CW Glass Works. Cynical. Daddy Dago. Don Dino. Danny Lavelle. Danny Pango. Dakota Storm Jones. Jackie Stag Swag. David Bat. Castillo. Dara. Dakota. Dead. Dennis Samaya. Diablo. Dingus Bat. Doug Prince. Dr. Cullen PhD. Yes, Chabano.com. D. Terry M. Dylan Coffee. 8 Bit Thug. Elias. LPO. Elsa. Emperor Pickle. Aesthetico. Ever Stone Isle, Nar, Fupa Saiyan, Frankenstein, Frisky Nippler, Glipseeker, Nine Cat, Goose, Six One One Two, the Darkest Black, Gargory, Gucci Plus, Asi Ibrahim Tanyurga, Hatsune Miku's Crackhouse, Arkash, Demon, Game and Station, Hexmax, Horn Tiger, Huey, I'm supporting K-Bash just because I wanted to make this part of the video longer, Ingenious Cloud, I punched a sandwich, Irrational, Irradiated Cherries, Dice Kyle, It's not bad, It's time to sue, It's not good, Ivy Ruth Langley, Jacob, James, Jason Lash, Jaden, Jay Dayas, JK Hedgehog. John Bo the Joker. Joke Frog. Jordan Joyner. Julian My Julian. Keegan Too Cool. Kata Snack. King Kuma. Clock Crated. Crazy Dark Chocolate. Kumi. Kais. Kyle. KZ Excellent. Lady Dentalian. Matrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Lethal Nibbles. Little Big Trouble. Loadsome Dung Eater. Low Fat Mogul. Lucas Boyd. Lucky McSmoky. Lucky Mac James. Magical Madman. Mara Ganger. Hercules. Mars Mugio. Maximilian Wolfgang Niver. Mike DeVere. Mookie Moo Official. Monochrome Only. Modi. Mr. Dodongo. Mr. Whiskey 282. Mr. Yeedy Dabface Mc Yoink Bomb, Nyra New, Nito Torpedo, Nico Puzzle Rack, Rory and Deridius, Not Nobel, Old Burgle, Old Man Cranberry, Omni Nerd Zero, Omni LK, The Plant, Pandemic Cowboy, Pinata, PK Gaming, Pontus Redding, Popular Hitman, Potato Gaming HD, Prismatic Dan, Fractal and Pals, Quaser McDougal, Quillwork, Quinn, Reasonable Willow, Reggie Rodriguez, Renteca Bond, Ricochet Frame, Rain, Relay, Roy Londo, Ryan Mori Brooks, Siren Smells Good, Salty Smasher, Scribe Slendy, Sakai No Order, Shinigami, Silver Bear, 909, Sing. God! Sleepy Wabbit, Suckum Bopper, Suck Dollager, Space Lizard, Spooky Grimalkin, Squidget, Squishward, Storm Strider, Streetum, Sublime Cataclysm, Super Sandwich Guy, Harvold's Quest, Short Shubbing the Ting, Big Buddy, The Clown Prince of Cream, The Digital Dutchman, The Good Lord Has Blessed Me, Hallelujah, The Green Loki, The Peacemaker Pyro, The Salt Knight, The Dick Mystic, Thrips Heart, Tickles McGuffin, Timid the Rider, Turtle Play, Travis Edwards, Twiddle Chung, Ty Guy 9001, Vid, Venom, Vice Puck, Viewers Like You, Waposa, Weed Trash, Wayland, Where Am I Help, Widgy, Winter Solstice, Wood TV, Zanny Tanner, Yashichi, Yekundo, Your Mom, Wiki Base, Zachary Lipsy, Zachary Z, Zanasso, Zane the Impure, Zane the Pure, Zed Slayer Gamer, Zero Salazar, Silvlin Ray, Zenova, Cyberpunk. If you'd like to help support the show, unlock new long-form projects, and help me keep improving, check out my Patreon. We got lots more videos in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.